Hello YouTube, how's it going? We got our second episode of NBA CBA lessons. Uh, we have Keith Smith on again. Also, Sean, how's it going? And then Siddharth uh, Sina, who we don't have his mic on right now, but maybe that'll be fixed. Sean, second time. Appreciate you showing showing up again Keith second time as well but before we get going I know a lot of stuff is going on with you Keith I just wanted to talk about that real quick about the NBA and what they might be able to do um, to get the league you know back up and running I'll just hand over to you Keith because I'm sure you've been talking about it all day <laughs> <laughs> yeah man. yeah yeah definitely have been talking about it all day um yeah you know it sounds like there's a little momentum to get the season potentially uh resumed at walt disney world here in central florida there is i wrote an article for yahoo sports you you can find it it, it, it doesn't take much work to find it um, out there i've probably retweeted it uh a million or so times myself but it is uh, out there there's a lot of reasons to do it here in florida and it sounds like there's a little momentum for that to potentially happen yeah, and that would be pretty cool. Uh, Disneyland, you know, the Lopez brothers are going to love it. Um, and we'll see how that goes. But let's get into the actual topic without, you know, wasting anyone's <laughs> time here. Uh, CBA 201 is what we're going to go over today. Let me share my screen to those on the call and then YouTube can see it anyway. Um, and this time the connections, no technological issues, thankfully. Um, and this time also, I got a couple remarks and feedback. Uh, we're going to go and take questions kind of, I'll ask for questions at the end of every slide. If you guys have questions, we can answer them and slow it down a little bit. I kind of flew through the first one. Um, so I'll try not to do that this time around anyway. NBA CBA 201. Let's get it started. Um, this this time I'm just going to go over some contracts, some end of contract scenarios, two ways, restricted free agency, and uh, that's kind of going to be it. it. There's a lot of stuff in here, and I think we can go into like cap holds and all that maybe on a third session. Um, after that, it gets really into the weeds. I don't know if I personally will even go that deep uh, in, in next in like pr uh, upcoming lessons. Anyway, let's get it going with maximum contracts. Uh, we kind of discussed this a little bit last week. I want to go into a little bit more detail because it does come up in, um, you know, restricted free agency in designated player stuff like you can there's different tiers of max contracts. I'll just get it going with the bullets here. So basically, if you're under seven years of service, it's 25% of the salary cap or 100%, 105% of the previous year's salary, whichever is greater. Uh, seven to nine years is 30% of the salary cap or 105 of the previous year. And then 10 plus years is 35 percent i like to think of these as tier one two and three max contracts just to make it a little bit easier to understand um the you know designated player stuff for rookies and veteran stuff as well stevie how's it going stevie just joined hey, us um, hey, and so the performance criteria in the bottom here is how you qualify for the next tier basically on based off accolades so if you're an all nba or defensive player of the year in two of the last three years or the year prior you qualify for a higher tier max even if you don't have the years of service requirement or you can be mvp in one of the last three seasons and you still qualify so again i'll stop here um are there any questions um or anything that i forgot keith i know you jumped in a couple times last time um, but we're going to get into like rookie and veteran specifics in, in a couple slides. So any questions? Do, do you have to be all NBA two, two out of three years or can it just be the one year? So it's basically the, the two out of three years basically only protects those who didn't make all NBA last year, but did make it the two years before that. Um, nice. Yeah. So because if you made it last year, it doesn't matter if you made it the two to three years before that. Um, it only matters if you made it last year. And then MVP is only one of the past three years. Um, all right, so next slide. Oh, let me click here. Okay. Um, rookie contracts. 
Uh, there's basically you can think of them as first round picks and second round picks. There's a rookie scale, which uh, is on the next slide. You can see these numbers. Again, I'll send these slides to you um, afterwards. Uh, first round picks are basically predetermined base salary amount. It's determined based off percentages and stuff. If uh, Keith, you want to give any details on that, feel free after I, I get done here. But predetermined base amount for each pick. So as you can see on this slide, first year, uh, first pick salary is 8.1 million. So 2019-20 NBA rookie scale. The the rookie this year, um, basically, who who was the first pick this year? God damn, I'm blanking. Wow. Um, Zion. Zion. Yeah, Zion's making 8.1 uh, this year. <laughs> anyway, let's go back here. Uh, they can sign for 80% to 120% of that base amount. Generally, rookies sign to 120% of that base amount. Um, I'm not, I'm sure there are examples of rookies that sign to other like 100% or 80%, uh, but that doesn't happen as frequently. Uh, Kevin Porter, uh, Kevin Porter from the Cavs. The, do you uh, know a reason year. for that, Keith? Uh, that was how he locked in his first round draft status, but it wasn't for the full, um, four years. I think it was only 80% in the first year only. And maybe then, uh, it slid up a little bit in that second year. And then it went up to the full 120 in years three and four, which are the team option years. But yeah, he, he, he did that this year before him. I think the last guy might've been Andre Robertson with the thunder. Who yeah, signed can, for only 80%. can I ask a question on that Keith? So, so would, a team prior to the draft process, if they were negotiating with a guy, then the, the guy's trying to get some guaranteed money, but the a team like the Cavs, for example, there, they, they're they looking to sign this guy and they think that he's going to turn out. So maybe they'll sign him for a little bit less, but he'll still be happy with that based on what they discussed. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's uh, We'll draft yeah. you in the first round. You'll get the guaranteed money, but we don't want to extend all the way. Think about it with the Cavs, right? They were right up against the luxury tax. This yeah. year for what they knew was going to be a really horrible team. So it wasn't a decision of let's pay even more for this really bad team. I think it was, hey, you want to be a first-round pick? If you're there and we can work a trade with Detroit, because if you remember Detroit had that uh, 30th pick in the draft going in, they were able to make that work. So that's that's you know really where it all came down to. Okay, got you. Thank you. Yep. yep. Thanks, Keith. Um, and then so rookie year deals or first-round picks – signed to two guaranteed years and then two team options after that. Those are actually the only contracts that have two years of team options besides little workarounds like non-guarantees and stuff, which uh, Sam Hinkie used to love doing. Um, and then second round picks are essentially just free agents. Uh, they don't qualify for the rookie exception. So you need cap space or an exception to sign uh, second round picks if you're at the cap or over the cap. Uh, you can sign them to a max deal if you want it. Um, obviously, that doesn't happen very frequently. The most notable recently is Alonzo Trier, who signed a two-year six million. I think that's the most a second round player has ever signed. Uh, so three million a year, that's somewhere, it falls within the range of the first round pick uh, rookie scale contracts um and yeah th that's kind of it for second round picks any other questions here beside before we move on cool um so rookie scale again you can see this again cbafaq.com all of these you can go one through 30 uh with all the picks uh, i just wanted to show an example here the fourth year is a base off a percentage of the third year the qualifying offer is a percentage of the fourth year and so on. Those are probably very complicated ways. But of one thing to, to know with that too, Con, can you flip back yep. to that slide real quick? These are the bases. So these are the hundred percent scale amounts. Yeah. These are not the one twenties. Um, and as Con said, almost everybody takes the one twenty. So if you're really trying to do a little bit of cap work, and the cap hold for these guys before they sign is one hundred and twenty percent of that first year yeah. salary. So that's just something to know in there. And also um, just a shout out to real GM. If you want to see these all the way through the uh, life of the, the current collective bargaining agreement, you can click on, on there under their GM laboratory, click on salary cap, click on rookie scale, and it'll show you, you could go year by year all the way through it. And I'll show you the whole thing because these are tied to the, what the current cap projections are. And they project that out uh, several years in the future as well. Yeah, I'll, um, I don't think that link's included. I'll include that link in the description so you have more sources, resources there. Um, thanks for that, Keith. And then 
Moving on, so end of contract, there's a lot of different end of contract scenarios, uh, a lot of details within them too. So again, any questions, I'll stop at, at the end of each slide. Um, so renegotiation is one thing that can happen. If you're at the end of your contract, Robert Covington did this, for example, um, you can renegotiate your salary for that last year to earn up to your max or up to the salary cap amount available to the team. Uh, so again, if you have 10 million left and you want to re-sign an $8 million player, you just, you can sign them to up to 18 million. So that last year, the contract would be 18 million. The Sixers did this and then they famously, I think they took this full 40% discount as you can see in the third bullet. So if you renegotiate and extend, so let's say you do that 8 million, you increase the salary to 18 million. The following year, you can decrease that by 40% of the renegotiated amount, up to 40% of the renegotiated amount. And then you can give him the 8% or 5% increases depending on his uh, bird rights. Um, and yeah, subsequent years actually cannot exceed 8%. I'm pretty sure, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, the renegotiation can only happen on contracts that are three or more years. So you would already have full bird rights um in that situation Correct. yeah yep uh and <laughs> go ahead um okay so zach levine a good example when a guy's been extended after his rookie deal uh zach levine's a good example four years he's two years in when the number is negotiated as they can negotiate now as it's been two years what like where is where is this how do they get the starting salary and decide what someone's going to end up being paid in two years time when when they negotiate um, when they ex actually starts if that makes sense so it's a, it's a negotiation okay um you know at that point it, it can be you know there's obviously the max bounds yeah. um that you can put put on that but that's that's all it is it's a negotiation okay. they're Negoti they're not yep yep so it's it's only you know um of uh yeah, as as it's uh no, notated out there, it's you know you can't do more than the eight percent. But but on, yeah. when you get out there, it's just a negotiation point. Okay, got you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and and there are limits, and I'm pretty sure you can only re renegotiate the last year of the contract. Is that pretty sure you can? That's that's the only thing you can do. Um, and then so veteran extension. This is just kind of besides it's rookie and veteran kind of. So there's you don't need like a lot. Of years here anyway only three to four year deals can be extended and you can ex well only three to four year deals can be extended after the second anniversary of signing the deal five to six year deals can be extended on the third anniversary of signing or extending uh so let's say someone extended this year it's been two years since they signed a four-year deal they extended today uh three years later if it's a five to six year deal from the time of the extension three years later, you can extend again. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it on that. You can sign up to 120% of the last year's salary of that deal um, or 120% of the average salary across the league, whichever one is higher. Uh, again, 8% increases or decreases allowed here. Again, since these are three to four year or five, six year deals, you will have full bird rights. So it's 8% increases or decreases. The designated veteran extension, basically it's the simplest way to describe this is you can sign a higher tier maximum deal. So if you have only seven to nine years experience, normally you wouldn't be able to sign the 35% max, but if you meet all of the eligi eligibility requirements, which is the performance criteria that we mentioned earlier, um, you must have only played for your current team throughout your career unless you were traded on your rookie deal. So if you're traded in your first four years, you can still be qualified for a designated veteran extension, which is just a 35% max earlier than normally qualified for it. Um, and yeah, those are basically everything or most of the things you need to know about extensions uh, for veterans. Is there any questions here before I move on? Cool. I will move on then over to rookies, rookie scale extensions. Uh, basically, you can extend um, in the off season before the final year 
of their contract before the first day of the season. So we always kind of hear rumors and news headlines and whatever before a player enters their fourth year of their deal, or are they going to extend, whatever. And that's up till the first day of the season. Um, you can add up to four years to the existing contract. Uh, and then again, designated rookie if they meet the performance criteria. So if during their rookie year, rookie scale deal, um, they meet the performance criteria to uh, all NBAs or defensive player of the years in the past three seasons or the year prior, and then an MVP. And this is basically the Rose rule. It's called the Rose rule because Rose was MVP on his third year um, and they wanted to be able to pay him the maximum deal. And in the in the CBA, they kind of made this clause where you can sign a higher level max because you're so valuable to the team. Um, and then again, end of contract scenarios. So options, team options, uh, a team has, and it's pretty self-explanatory. The team has an option to keep the player for one more year um, at the end of the contract. I probably have a typo there, uh, but Team options can only be one year except for rookie scale deals. Uh, you can't have two team option years, um, but teams get around this by having like a non-guaranteed then a team option. So that's kind of like two team options because non-guaranteeds are uh, ways for teams to, you know, have an option for the contract. Um, and and you'll, you'll hear that reported a lot by media that it's an option year and it's and it's really not. It, it might be non-guaranteed or... Or you might hear, well, they have a team option for a guy, but it's it's guaranteed for only, you know, two million. You can also have a team option on a non guaranteed year, which gets a little uh, funky and weird. But but just you know something to note there. You'll hear uh, team option regularly when it's really actually non guaranteed money, and you'll you'll see the cap nerds like me will be like, I wonder if this is a real team option or not, because it does matter for a handful of things. Yeah, the navigating all these cap scenarios for teams, end of roster guys, and <laughs> it gets uh, a bit complicated, but this is um, hopefully good enough for now. A player option is basically just a player version, a uh, player has the option for the last year of the contract. Uh, you can't have an option that is lower than the salary of the prior year, at least a player option. So if you're making $10 million this year, your option can't be for $9 million. Um, but there's a thing called an ETO, so an early termination option. It's essentially a player option with a little bit of different rules. Um, it can only be on the fifth year of a five-year deal. Uh, it can be lower than the prior year. Uh, and then you can't extend the contract of an early termination that has been declined, but you can extend a player option that's been declined. That's That was an interesting thing that I learned um, today while going over some of this stuff. Um, but I, it's not, I don't think it's as common. I feel like Mello had an early termination option um, with the Knicks. Uh, I don't really recall any other examples. I'm sure there are a few. Keith, I don't know if you have any off the top of your head. Yeah, they've become very uncommon now. Uh, Mike Connolly, I think, has the last one mm -hmm. um, that's active because it has to be on a five-year contract. So it can only be when they re-sign with their current team for a five-year deal. So it's uh, they're, they're pretty uncommon. You don't really see them much anymore. Um, one thing I would say, if you're interested in a lot more detail on this, uh, if you Google Keith Smith, real gm contract options um you should it should pop up with an article i wrote forever ago for real gm that breaks down all the details everything you could ever want to know about options uh their first part of regm uh, real gm cba encyclopedia yep go check that out again maybe i can include that in the description as well um so end of the side any questions before i move on here please please um Oh, now I've lost my train of thought. Uh, the qualifying offer. What if a, if a rookie takes the qualifying offer um, and bets on themselves? Basically, that just what does that mean for them when the qualifying offer is done? They are just an unrestricted free agent yep. at the end. Yep, okay, they're just you. an unrestricted free agent. And for the have... rookie scale, guys? Is that no, no, no. The, no. the, the um, qualifying the, after offer. The... Yeah, so, so if they sign the qualifying offer at the end of the first round rookie scale... Yep. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah, you just become a free agent. 
Got you. Um, okay. With that unrestricted free agent, because they'll have more than uh, years of service or off rookie scale. However, if they're not a rookie scale guy, this came up with Matthew Delvadova a couple years back. Um, he signed, didn't sign the qualifying offer, but he still only had two years of service or maybe at three, but he was then a restricted free agent again, because he didn't meet their, uh, uh, years of service qualifier to, to oh, hit wow. unrestricted free agency. So it's slightly different rules, um, for the rookie scale versus guys coming off the rookie scale. Okay. So what if someone's, so, it, so if someone's fourth year is declined, then yep. They, and they only have three years. Is, is, do they still like, how many years to meet? No, their, so that's the only place it works really different with the years of service. If it's a for, first round guy and they decline okay. one of the third or fourth year team option, they're okay. automatically um, eligible for unrestricted free agency and then stay in unrestricted free agent. Once you achieve unrestricted free agency, you don't go back to being a restricted free agent. I got you. So Harry Giles is a good example. That's yep. Sacramento declined his fourth year. He's now unrestricted in next year's next year's free agency. Correct. Yeah, yeah. for whatever right. stupid reason they did that. But that's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's good, and also <laughs> the Kings, for example, if they they technically can sign your the player that you declined, but you can only sign up to the value yep. of what the contract would have been. But right. every other team can sign them as if they oh. were a free agent. Yep. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, so Giles can be signed all the way up to his max by anybody except for the Kings. Kings are capped at, you know, two, three million, whatever that, that option year was. Yep. Um, and we do have a restricted free agency slide, but a lot of those questions uh, have been answered. So anyway, end of contract scenarios here. Again, some stuff we've already discussed, but non-guaranteed contracts, like I said, similar to team option in terms of like how it works. The player doesn't have control, the team has control, um, but a portion of the salary can be guaranteed. So let's say you sign someone to 10, mil 10 million for two years, um, 10 million each year for two years, you can say, okay, 50% of your second year contract is guaranteed. That's some protection uh, for the player and for the team um, and all that. So you see non-guaranteeds a lot. A team must, so the option, the guarantee date must be before or on January 7th, 5 p.m. Eastern because the player needs to clear waivers by the salary guarantee date of January 10th. So it takes three days to clear waivers. Uh, if you don't waive them or not guarantee their contract by that 5 p.m. Eastern time, uh, then you have to pay the rest of their deal that they, that they signed for. Um, guarantee percent, and I'll let you go, Keith, after this, uh, guarantee percentage or yeah, the guarantee percentage can't increase from year to year. So you can't have like, okay, next year you have 50% guaranteed. And then the next year after that, you have 75% guaranteed or whatever. I can only, um, stay or go down, uh, Keith, what were you just going to say? Yeah. And let's be clear on the, um, the, the date for the contract become fully guaranteed. That's completely negotiable that is just the last date oh yeah is uh, january 7th you could have it be it's very common for those to be july 1st uh july 7th towards the end of the moratorium and those kind of things um you can lock into whatever date the player uh agree player and their agent agree to with the team yeah that's definitely true i meant to put that in there i think it's after the last game of the season up until January or January seventh is when you can negotiate that guarantee. I'm pretty sure, because um, because I've seen June guarantee dates too, like June thirtieth or whatever. Yeah, it's usually the, what they do is they push them all the way back um, for the 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 next year. Though they yeah. usually won't do it until after the NBA draft is generally. So you might see a late June, but occasionally you see one earlier than that. Every once in a while, there's something weird in there. Nene had a weird one, which was January of this season for next year so yep. um so you can really they can be just about whatever you want them to be yep and con i apologize man but i gotta drop off because i gotta jump on a radio hit but thank you guys for i having appreciate me. you keith thank you for hopping on all right, man. talk to you guys later talk to you yeah. bye all right so continuing on and i mean we got through most of it anyway um and you know, Keith gives a lot more detail <laughs> than than I even know, which is awesome. But let's let's get through the rest of these slides. Uh, non guaranteed, we kind of talked about, yeah. And then so waivers, kind of mentioned waivers, but a team can waive a player's contract. Essentially, they must pay the remaining amount. 
uh, you can't sign a waived player. So if you waive a player, you cannot sign them until one year after termination or um, one year or July 1st after the final year of the initial contract. So if you waive a player that has like a year or two left, you can't re-sign them until Ju the July 1st after the date the contract was supposed to end. Uh, and then a couple other wave stuff, wave and stretch. Uh, so you hear like a team stretched a player's salary. If you have two, if you have one year left on your sal on the salary and a team wants to stretch you, they can stretch it for two X plus one years. So X is just the years remaining. So normally if you have one year left, you can stretch that contract for up to three years, basically. So if there's nine million left on the deal and you waive the player, now your cap hit is only three million, but for the next three years, instead of nine million for this year. Most famously, like Josh Smith uh, waived, they waived his, how much was it? Like 25 million over two years. They waived that and then it was like five year, five million over three years, something like that. I know it's five million a year. If I don't know if it was five or seven years that it was waived over or stretched over. Okay. Um, but Josh Smith is still making $5 million a year. Uh, let just, just let that be known. Um, and then buyouts. Uh, I put it into this waiver section because when you buy a player out, they enter waivers. Um, this is basically when a player and a team agree to a price where the team doesn't have to pay the full deal. The player gives a couple back, a couple million back, a few amount back, and then generally a player has like a wink wink deal with another team they know a team wants to sign them so whatever that contract that they're going to get from the new team they generally give back to the team they're agreeing to a buyout with because they're not going to lose much um and yeah again end of the slide here so any questions here silence means continue to me um again restricted free agency we talked about most of this already but let me just kind of repeat a qualifying offer it's a one-year contract after that is 125 percent of the prior year's salary um a cap hold i should have included the cap hold stuff here um a cap hold is different basically so a player can have a 20 million dollar cap hold but only like a 11 million dollar qualifying offer that's why you see uh, teams or players, like, if they're going to take the qualifying offer, they want it done quickly so the cap hold goes away. Or they, I don't know, I, I'm not thinking of clear examples here. Go ahead. Follow on from, so if the cap hold goes away because you, you, you extend the qualifying offer to them and they take that qualifying offer, does that mean the cap hold comes off the books yeah. and it just has the qualifying offer sitting on the books instead? Yeah, so so the qualifying offer is only 125% of the prior year salary. The cap hold for a rookie scale guy is like 300% of the prior year salary. Yeah. They changed yeah. that because I think it was Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi's deal was really low because he was the 15th pick and his cap hold was not 300%. It was a lot lower. So the Spurs were able to maneuver and, and sign free agents and stuff and then sign Kawhi to the max. Um, because he had such a low cap hold. After that, yeah. the league kind of switched it up, saying, okay, you need 300% as a cap hold, so your star rookies or whatever are actually worth a lot on your free agency cap sheet, and you can't go and sign a bunch of different max guys or, or high salary guys next to your yeah. star rookie. Um, and yeah, the value of the qualifying offer is highly complicated. Uh, if you go to NBA CBA FA or just CBA FAQ.com again in the link in the description, or I'll email you the link as well. You can see all the starter criteria rules, but basically if they don't meet the starter criteria, their qualifying offer is a lot lower. So is their cap hold. If they do meet starter criteria. So if you're selected like 25th and you're a starter for a team, then your cap hold is that like 300% and like all, all that stuff. Um, so that's really complicated. I don't want to go into all of that here. You can do a little bit more research there. It does come into play in certain cases and is important uh, to teams and their cap situations. Um, when a player, when does a player become a restricted free agent? Again, when a team needs to give the qualifying offer, uh, when they can do that is for first round picks after the fourth year of the rookie scale. So if both team options are accepted and the four years are up, and the team gives a qualifying offer, then they are restricted free agents. Um, if the team options are declined, like we discussed, the players become normal free agents. And the whole rule with the team, 
that waive them or decline them can only offer uh, up to what that option was. Second round or undrafted players um, become restricted at the end of any of the first three seasons, their first three seasons in the NBA, and the team offers a qualifying offer. Two-way players can also become uh, restricted free agents if they have 15 days of A-team experience. So you know how we'll get to two ways too, but uh, they have 45 total days. If they are with the A-team practicing or playing for 15 days, then a team can offer them a qualifying offer. That's generally for the minimum amount, and it's not too much, but I wanted to mention that in here as well. Any questions on restricted free agents? All right, moving on. Uh, Two-way contracts, and this is our last slide here. Two-way contracts, each team is allowed to sign two two-way players. Generally, they're assigned to the G League team and they're brought up and down as needed, but they can only be brought up for 45 days during the regular season. If you guys remember, um, in the first year of the two-way, so last season, there was a lot of like maneuvering uh, for players to only travel on game days and not be on the A team because they needed days. So like, fa like I think the Clippers with Tyron Wallace and um, I forgot who their other two-way guy was, but they were like traveling like crazy because the team didn't want to use up days. They were flying in and then playing the same night or whatever. It was just kind of getting crazy. So the league decided to not include travel days in the... Um, the 45 days so now players it's a little bit easier for them to you know maneuver from the g league to the a team without being crazy um and then during the season a two-way player can only sign a full nba contract with the current team they're on that's the perk of for the team for signing a two-way player uh they can convert their two-way contract to a pro rated minimum and what that means is, let's say it's halfway through the season and the minimum contract is 800K. If they convert it halfway through the season, then it becomes 400K for them for the rest of the season. Uh, they also, every day of those 45 days, they make one over whatever, whatever one day is in terms of a percentage of the full season times 800K. Um, that's the amount they make for that one day. So they make more money when they're brought up to the A team. Uh, and yeah, they can also be traded. Two-way players can be traded. Uh, they need to wait 30 days after signing that contract to be traded, but they can be traded. Um, and any questions on two-way guys? All right, well, any general questions? This is um, the end, again, about 31, 33 minutes, pretty consistent with the length here. Um, any questions, anything else that you're curious to learn about that you haven't learned yet? Or, uh, cause I think there, I think part three will probably be the last part. We'll have cap hold. We'll have maybe some other stuff, um, to discuss, but I just want to leave it up to you guys on the call to see if there's any other questions. Nope. Okay, cool. Um, well, appreciate you all coming on. I know if Several of you are muted. Siddharth, I still haven't heard from you. You you seem like you're on the call. Um, Sean and Stevie, thank you for hopping on. Mm -hmm. Th thank you to, to Keith for hopping on as well. Um, if you're listening to this on the Bench Mob podcast, appreciate y'all. Hit me up uh, at the Bench Mob NBA or at Iconic. Um, I'll be sending these out, these resources out in my newsletter, which should be getting back up and running in a week or two. Um, and the resources are below for YouTube. If you're watching, resources are in the description. Uh, appreciate you all and peace.